Happy almost Halloween, plant friend. It's spooky season, and I thought this would be the perfect time to invite my witchy plant friend Raquel back to the podcast. You might remember her from our past episode called Everyday Plant Magic. Raquel has become a dear plant friend of mine for several years, and she is a self-identifying green witch, a magical woman who works with plant energies to live a better life. So as we're looking at Halloween this week, I figured an entire episode on how to make our lives more magical with plants would be the perfect topic for the spirit of this week. Get ready to invite more planty magic into your life. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, the Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Welcome back, plant friends, and happy spooky season. If you're new here, hi, my name's Maria. I'm the host of the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, and I'm here to help you cultivate more joy in your life by caring for plants successfully. And if you are a recurring listener, welcome back, my sweet plant friend. I love you. It means so much that you show up to the podcast every week listening to this fun content, and I think you're going to be excited And I'm excited to introduce you to a different side of myself today than the classic interviewer that you hear drilling down into understanding light and how to grow garlic and flowers. But today we're moving to a little bit more of the spiritual, a little bit more of the woo-woo, a little bit of the witchy side of plant care and communing with nature. You'll hear more about this today in the episode. I have to disclose, I'm a little nervous about sharing today's episode. It's definitely a different side of me than you've normally heard. But I have to tell you, plant friends, as I've moved to the woods, if you've been listening, you know, I used to live in 500 square feet in New York City. I moved to the woods almost three years ago, and my life has completely changed. I have slowed down. I have started living more aligned with the seasons, and my relationship with nature has deepened. It's gone far beyond just houseplants. Houseplants are how my relationship with nature began when I was living in New York. But when I live to the woods, I'm on five acres. I'm surrounded by trees. My relationship with nature has really deepened. And this deepened connection has brought an understanding of a different definition of magic and joy into my life that I didn't know was possible. And it's had me really thinking about spirituality and nature and the divine and learning to live more in tune with Mother Nature herself and our Earth's rhythms. As I have been on this kind of two-year journey of slowing down and connecting to the seasons and to the earth, in my research and exploration, I came upon this title called Green Witch. There was a great book that I read called The Green Witch, and it spoke to so many ideas that I was finding myself naturally pulled to, living in sync with the moon, following the seasons, rooting into all of the elements, getting your feet on the ground and moving energy. And the more I invited nature into my life, the more magic, the more joy, because to me, magic and joy is kind of interchangeable, the more joy came. I have to say these last two years have probably been the most joyful and the most magical of my life. And I think in part, it's because of me opening myself up to the opportunity of the energies of nature and the earth. So I want to preface this conversation that it might be out there for some of you listeners, and that's totally fine. I have 210 episodes of other way more plant science-based episodes that you're welcome to binge. I understand that the term witch or magic or spirituality might be triggering for people. It was triggering for me (laughs) two years ago as I started this journey. I'm not saying you need to associate yourself with any of these terms. I'm not saying you have to come out of this episode, you know, diving into being a green witch. The purpose of this episode is to introduce you to a deeper and alternative way of living, a different mindset, how we can use nature to open our mind to new possibilities. And who doesn't want a little more magic in their life? Who doesn't want a little more joy? Who doesn't want a little more awe? We talk about awe a lot in this episode, awe, A-W-E. I feel like I'm saying it weird. But as a kid, we're so much more open to magic and awe and mystery, and then we become adults and that part of ourselves gets shamed and cut off. And so this episode is just an invitation to 
open your heart, open your mind, and invite a little bit of magic in whatever that looks like for you. It can be with your houseplants. It can be with your garden. It could be with your trees. We give you tons of different opportunities to explore. I highly recommend you reading our guest Raquel's book, Everyday Plant Magic, which dives way deeper into the topics that we kind of cover on a very high level. And my true desire for you today is that at the end of the episode, you have one little bit of magic or optimism or energy or joy, whatever you want to call it. I hope something new flows into your life through plants from this conversation. Before we dive in, Raquel is a plant friend of mine that I'm very fortunate to have made on the internet, on Instagram. And so I wanted to welcome a few of our newest plant friends in the Growing Joy Garden Society, Lucretia R., Krista E., and Carol P. Welcome. Welcome, ladies. Welcome to the Garden Society. I'm so excited to get to know you better in the platform. If you don't know what my Growing Joy Garden Society is, it's my online iOS Android app. You can also access it through a computer. It's my private algorithm and troll-free community platform for this international base of plant friends to connect. And the three goals of the platform are to help you make new plant friends, propagate your plant care knowledge, and grow more joy in your life. If you're interested in joining us and also supporting the show through your subscription to the society, you can go to jointhegardensociety.com to learn more. All right. It's spooky season. Halloween's coming. Let's root in to our inner magic and the magic that plants can give us. Here's Raquel. Raquel, welcome back. I think this is your first time on the Growing Joy podcast as as compared to Bloom and Grow Radio, right? Yes, that would be correct. Yeah, welcome back. I'm so happy to have you back, my witchy, magical friend. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for having me. I love chatting with you. I love being here. It's always such an honor. So thank you. It's so fun. So you had a fabulous episode on our podcast about Everyday Plant Magic, your book. You are this magical planty goddess that educates about plants and succulents, but also magic and healing intuitively. So I hope everybody listening has listened to the previous episode we did last year. But in case they haven't, before we dive into the magic of how to be a green witch, which is something very, very near and dear to you and my hearts, I would love to just have you give a brief introduction to the audience of how you became this green witch that you are today and uh, the journey that's taken you. You've you've had a lot of twists and turns in your planty journey, so I'd love to hear a little bit about it. Oh, yes. Lots of pivots, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so I've always had a really personal and spiritual relationship with nature. I was raised in a religious environment, religious home. Religious dogma was never my thing, but I always felt such a connection to the natural world. And I really felt like I communicated with trees as a little kid. Like my first best friend was that crab apple tree in our front yard. I freaking loved that tree so much. Like I remember it like viscerally. And so when I was studying in school, I got really interested in ecology as well as sociology because I'm really interested in people and society and how people kind of work. So I studied ecology and I was really, really into the ocean. I'm a cancer sun, cancer rising. I'm a water baby. And I was always infatuated with marine mammals in particular. So I studied marine mammals. I After I graduated from college, I moved to Hawaii and started working with marine research, marine education. So for me, I really felt my path was in environmental education. I've known from a young age that I am here both to connect on a personal level with nature, but to help other people connect with nature as well. And so for a long time, I did that in zoos and aquariums with curriculum writing, with education, teaching, presenting. For a while, I was an animal trainer out at the Wild Animal Park, and I worked with the animal ambassadors. So we would bring them out to people and talk about them and their habitats. And I got to play with really cool animals, which was fun. But for a long time, plants were kind of just like the background for me. Like I had that relationship with trees, but then for a while it was really about like the fuzzy, cute animals that I can like touch and talk to and train and be with. And the plants were just kind of like the backdrop. You talk a lot about that. Yeah, in your classic book. plant blindness. Yeah. 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 I mean, I appreciated them. I could tell that I felt better around plants, but I didn't go any deeper than that. Yeah, the focus is on the animals. 
Yeah. And every time I tried to bring a plant into my home at that time, I totally killed him. <laughs> like I could not keep up. <laughs> I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah. I really could not keep a house plant alive. So after I lived in Hawaii, I got, I came, I moved to California. I was working at the San Diego Zoo. And then I went and got my master's in marine biodiversity and conservation from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography here in La Jolla. And I loved that, but also it was so much doom and gloom. I mean, what we were studying, how we were studying about the impacts of human society on the planet, what we're facing with climate change, with ocean acidification, with pollution, with plastics, like all of it, right? And I really fell into a deep spiral of anxiety and despair, which we now know has a term called eco-anxiety, which I'm sure we'll talk about at a future date as well, Maria. But that was really my first bout with like, really bad anxiety. I went to therapy. I got on medication. I had a period of time where I was like, maybe I should just like back away from all of this and become a nanny or something. Like I just felt like, is there even a point in trying to educate? Do we have a different way we can go? Like I was really in a deep questioning place of like, should I just put on blinders and be like everyone else and pretend like nothing's happening? Right. Because I don't know if I can deal with how this feels inside of me. Thankfully, therapy helps. <laughs> Shout out. Everyone needs a little bit of therapy, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Letting yourself actually feel what you feel and process it with help and support helps. It works. And then I got a dream job after I got my master's. I was uh, hired by the Monterey Bay Aquarium and I worked in education there. And so then being in a place in an institution that really is doing a lot for the environment really helped me with that feeling of kind of anxiety and fear and depression. When I got pregnant, we moved back down here to San Diego. I took a little break from working. And that's when the plants really started coming into my life, when I was actually pregnant with my first daughter. And it was almost like there was this stillness that came over me energetically that allowed me to actually see and feel the plants for their life force energy. They no longer were just this backdrop. They had their own personality, their own magnetism that was really calling to me. So I started bringing plants in and I could keep them alive. And I think they like helped me train me to like be a mom in some ways, even though I'd been keeping animals alive for a really long time. There was something about bringing the plants in and seeing them stay green that like helped me feel more confident in my abilities as a first time mother. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. That nurturer, it connects you with your inner nurturer. Yeah, the nurturing. Also like the silent communication. Because really, when plants communicate with us, it's not through sound. It's through the visuals. It's through the energies. And when you're a mom of a newborn, like the only sounds, they they do make sounds, but you have to learn how to kind of have more subtle communication as well. So I think the plants really help me. Yeah, a heightened sensitivity. Totally. They really help me with that. So fast forward a few years, I had a lot of houseplants already. I was starting to garden more, grow zucchinis and actually like grow zucchinis, you know. <laughs> and then I had my second daughter. And then about 10 months after she was born, my anxiety came back really strong. And I'm sure this also had to do with some hormonal disruptance, postpartum stuff. But my anxiety came in and then insomnia hit. And so the anxiety and the depression and the lack of sleep was just the spiral that I had. And I couldn't break free from it. And I went back to therapy and I went back on medication and I just could not seem to break away from this existential like fear and dread that seemed to permeate every waking moment, which was most of my moments because I was barely sleeping. So... (laughs) My therapist, thankfully, was also kind of an energy practitioner on the side. She recommended this great book. I'm sure we talked about this, Artist's Way. I started journaling. I started then feeling the need to be creative. I started making art with succulents and everything changed for me. Everything. Just in those moments where I could be quiet, making art with the succulents, with the soil, with the stones, like my brain completely went quiet and I was in my body. I was in my creativity. I was in the present moment. And that's how Infinite Succulent began. I created art pieces because it felt like medicine to my soul. (laughs) And then I started gifting that to people. And then because I'm a teacher by nature, I started doing workshops. We did a wonderful workshop together during that time for Succulent Crowns. My first book, Infinite Succulent, literally fell into my lap. I had an editor reach out saying, I love your Instagram. We want to do a succulent craft book. Are you interested? 
So it was all this magic was happening. Meanwhile, the plants were still taking me on this journey of inner discovery. They were still taking me on this journey of subtle sensitivities. I found some crystals, started planting in crystals. All of a sudden, I could feel plant energy moving up into my hands. And I was just like, what is happening? So thankfully, because the plants have this great influence, my curiosity was really peculiar. So I started getting curious about like what's happening with plants and the human nervous system, what's happening with crystals and the metaphysics of that. Imagine that beautiful harmony wafting its way through your home or porch while you sit cozily bundled up enjoying the fall foliage with your favorite warm drink. Or better yet, gifting the glorious experience of a Wind River chime to a loved one, so every time they hear it, they think of you. Plus, if the fall aesthetic attracts you, Wind River chimes come in a variety of deliciously rich fall colors. I personally have their deep purple and their deep green, and they look so beautiful on my balconies. As the school year picks up and summer fades away, a Wind River wind chime can be the antidote to your back-to-school stress. Although the frenetic energy of the season can feel like it combats nature, which is slowing down and preparing to rest, your Wind River wind chimes will bring you back to yourself with their soothing, harmonious songs. Today, Wind River is choosing to use their ad time to gift you a mindful moment with their chimes. So enjoy. Treat yourself or someone you love to these glorious sounds by gifting a Wind River wind chime, which you can personalize. Gift them the mindfulness that comes along with these wind chimes, plant friends. To personalize it for free, you can use code GROWINGJOY at checkout at windriverchimes.com. That coupon code will get you a free engraving on any of the engravable wind chimes on their website. They come in a variety of colors, a variety of sizes, and a variety of sounds. You can actually mix and match chimes to go together, or you can have them individually like I do. So head to windriverchimes.com, listen and learn, and don't forget to use code GROWINGJOY at checkout to receive your free engraving. Last call for garlic, last call, last call for garlic, plant friends. <laughs> Territorial Seed Company, today's sponsor, wants to know it's the last call for garlic to get your garlic ordered and in the ground before the frosts come. Garlic is an amazing member of the onion family with a tantalizing flavor that has earned it a place in cuisine across the globe. And it's an incredibly diverse crop. The garlic flavors range from mild, sweet, to mellow, to hot and spicy. Some are white, some are purple, some are red. Growing the different varieties of garlic that you have accessible to you as a gardener is so much different, is so much more rewarding than the bland bulbs that you find in the supermarket. I'm so excited to be growing garlic for the first time this year. I'm growing both hard neck and soft neck varieties. One of the varieties is called music, which I love because I have a degree in music. Garlic is an exceptionally cold, hardy plant. You got to put your garlic in the ground in the fall, six to eight weeks before the ground freezes. So now is the time. If you want to order your garlic, you can get 10% off from Territorial Seed Company before it's gone. All you have to do is head to territorialseed.com slash growing joy to get a 10% discount and grab your garlic before it's gone. You don't want to plant garlic that you get from the grocery store that can be treated with chemicals that make the garlic stop growing. You want to order garlic from a trusted seed provider and Territorial Seed is giving you 10% off at territorialseed.com slash growing joy. And that's how my second book, Everyday Plant Magic, came around. There was a lot of magic in how that book actually manifested. I'm pretty sure we went into that in our last conversation together, so people can listen back to that. But basically, the plants have led me on this journey of my own reclamation of my magic and my gifts. So through working with plants, I have discovered that not only am I a teacher, I am also an energy transformer, an energy mover. I am also an intuitive and a medium, and I am what I would consider a witch. I am someone who works with the magic and the energies of nature for my own wellness, as well as for the wellness of my family and what I believe is for the whole world as well. (laughs) I love that. And I think that definition of witch for you is important because I think that term witch is so stigmatized in society right now. 
as I've moved to the woods, I have also noticed a deep reconnection, reclamation, remembering of this natural, magical, spiritual side of myself that I was like completely disconnected from when I was living in the city. But I have just personally felt, I've read a lot of books about plant magic. I've read The Green Witch, which we'll talk about. Obviously, I've read your book. I've read a lot of Juliet Diaz's books just because this it fascinates me. I think it's really important how you defined the term witch for yourself. Because I think in modern society, witch is a very stigmatized term. I know that as I've been on my own spiritual journey, as I've moved to the woods and started living, you know, more in line with the moon and deepened my spiritual practice, even for me, using that word witch with people around me, it's like, oh, she's the witchy one. And it's kind of almost in a negative way or in a like, oh, Maria's being witchy, like I roll, you know, woo woo, witchy, whatever. Like people look at these things very negatively. Like, what do you think about that? Oh, I had a lot of thoughts about that. I think part of it is the history of like the witch burnings, right? Like the history of the Inquisition. And we have to understand that when they said that they were burning witches, they were burning people who were practitioners of the land. They were burning people who knew how to work with herbal medicines, who knew how to work with the seasons. And they were also burning people who weren't Christian. So we just need to <laughs> like start with that. And I am not Christian. I was raised Jewish. And there was a lot of that in the Inquisition as well. So I think that, first of all, knowing that the term witch was defined by a colonizing institution in a lot of ways. So there's this collective understanding of witch as being this like bad black magic thing. Interesting. And then now in today's society, we do have that kind of eye roll around the woo woo. Although I think that is shifting a little bit because we're just in a really interesting place where we're more willing to recognize we don't know what we don't know. And even what we do know, we don't really know, right? Like so much of science is actually still theories. And I feel like people are just getting to a point where whatever society has been doing hasn't really been working. So I think people are opening their eyes to these different ideas, especially when it comes to uh, the earth and and caring for the earth and going back to these older practices and regenerative gardening and more uh, more focus on sustainability. Like that's what the healers and the spiritual, (laughs) that's what the witches were doing back then too, you know? So we're going to talk about the green witch today, which is the planty witch, you know, the witch that celebrates plants. But Something that I didn't realize when I read a book about witches, I think it's called, I don't know, whatever, one of Juliet Diaz's books, is all the different types of witches that there are. So can you kind of go into that? Because I didn't know that. Yeah, I don't know if that's necessarily my expertise. I mean, I can tell you what I know. But before we do that, I just want to talk a little bit about like that witch, like how do you feel about identifying as a witch? Because I think you have like the mainstream society that's like, oh, rolling eyes, woo woo. But then you also have, especially with like TikTok and witch talk, you also have from the side that's with you, like this gatekeeping or a sense of like, you're not witchy enough or right. So when you're self-identifying as a witch, which I do, I totally self-identify as a green witch, a nature witch, and I'm not part of necessarily a coven and I'm self-taught, it can kind of feel like, do I even really exist? Like, But it's okay to define things. And that's one thing I love about witchcraft is that it's okay for you to be self-taught. It's okay for you to be a solo practitioner. It's okay for you to define it for yourself. So now going into the idea of like how many different types of witches there are or different types of magic, I think this is a lot the human desire to label and compartmentalize. A (laughs) hundred percent. So... I know personally, I work with green magic. I'm a green witch. So that means I'm working with the the energies of nature, mainly plants, the moon, crystals, the seasons, the animals, the soil, like just nature. And if you think about it, I define humans as nature too. So I think even witches who consider themselves more like relational, relationship witches, I mean, in some ways, That's also a bit of green witchery. There are definitely um, witches who like to work more with deities. So people who really work with like Hecate or like other deities, that's not really my practice. For me, my deities are the trees and the plants and the bugs and the birds. I like learning about it, like hearing about it. There are witches who specifically work with minerals, with stones, with crystals, and like they really focus on that. There are witches who work more intentionally with white magic. So that's the idea of, 
using more of like the light side of things. And then you have witches who like to work more with the shadow and the what you would consider more dark magic. Although I wouldn't consider shadow working with the shadow and using that as magic is necessarily dark magic. For me, dark magic is about sending ill intentions to other people. And that's not something that I do in my practice. But there's definitely people who do that. There's also the kitchen witch, the one who makes the oh, magic yeah. in the kitchen. I kind of think of Mama Fire yeah. when I think about that. When I think about the there's kitchen. There's eclectic witches. And kitchen witches to me are part of green. Like To me, kitchen witchery is very much a part of green magic and being a green witch. Because what are you working with in kitchen magic? Typically herbs. Plants, plants, baby. You you're, plants. you're making tinctures. You're <laughs> cooking up plants. No, totally. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting just on my personal journey. I don't know if I identify with the word witch, but something that you just said resonates so deeply with me that I don't know. You know, I've been in a spiritual existential kind of crisis of I was raised very Catholic and I don't identify as Catholic. And I don't know my my true thoughts about what God is, but I know that there is and how you want to define it. You, as you talk about these ideas of feeling like you have to like have this codified definition that you can like whip out and show people at parties. But what I do know <laughs> is I'm highly spiritual, uh, especially as I've gone through this melanoma journey. Like I feel like that was a spiritual initiation. I very much believe in a greater power. I don't know what that power's name is, but I feel the most spiritual, the most connected to this greater source, the most connected to myself with nature. And, you know, I do this practice in the morning because I found it from some like cartoon I watched one day, but like I thank the trees on my property. And in this way, I'm praying like to the trees, like I'm, or I'm praying with the trees, I'm praying with nature. Um, And I've only recently been able to even feel comfortable using the word praying because I've, you know, I'm packing a lot of stuff from, from my childhood, but, um, you know, it's, it is very interesting how simple your spirituality can feel when you do step into nature and when you do work with natural energies and how much you don't need to label it. And yes, we're labeling green witch today because it is a celebrated belief system that we're going to dive into. But I do think nature is such a beautiful way for people to work their way back into spirituality also, like if they've left, if they've lost it, um, which many of us have. And yeah, and that in itself is magic. That in itself is magical. Yes, yes. Let's define magic really quick. I was, that's exactly what I was going to ask you. So yes, please, (laughs) let's define magic. Because I, as I mentioned in the last time I was on the show, I really had to do that for myself when I was writing Everyday Plant Magic. It's a word that we can throw around and not really know what it means. So for me personally, magic as a noun is the knowing that everything is energy. Every single thing is energy. And that knowledge that lets us know that there's magic available everywhere. Now, the magic as a verb is intentionally moving, manipulating, transforming that energy for your own desired reasons, right? So the way that you started working with plants, Maria, and the way that it transformed your practice of self-care, the way that you see yourself, the way that you live your life, like that's plant magic, That is you open to the magic that nature has, that the plants have. So when I think about plants, they are amazing magicians. All they're doing all the time is transforming energy. You know, they take the raw energy from the earth, they take the energy from the sun, and they turn it into material that we then use for food, for medicine, for structure, for shade, for pleasure, for connection. So they are totally alchemists. And another thing about being a witch um, and the idea of like religion versus spirituality. When it comes to witchcraft too, you know, for a while I was like, can I really claim this title? Because I'm not Wiccan. Wiccan in itself is a form of religion that some witches hold that has specific holidays. It's a religion, but you don't have to practice Wicca or be Wiccan to be a witch. To be a witch is just to be someone who is intentionally moving energy. That's a great differentiation. That's really helpful. So let's dive into the green witch a little bit more specifically. So, you know, if a witch is someone who is intentionally moving energies, the green witch is intentionally using their energies and, and nature's energy in order to 
create. What does it look like to be a green witch? It looks like a really intimate, personal, creative, loving relationship with Earth. I mean, that's what it looks like for me. (laughs) I think that's what it looks like for you. Obviously, each person can define that in their own way, but that's really the way I see it. And I know that working with the plants helped me come back to natural cycles. It helped me work with the energies of the moon. And now I share about the new moon energy and the full moon energy every month on my moon blog. I make YouTube videos around it. Like I work intensely with the moon. And what I love about working with the moon is when you start working with her, she starts working with you. (laughs) And a lot of magic comes in your life that way. I work with the seasons. I'm going to be honest with you, plant friends. When it comes to sponsors, I've been very wary about working with a specific houseplant brand as a sponsor of the show because this show is all about houseplants and I just can't work with any brand. I don't want to steer you wrong. I'm so excited that I just got back from visiting the Proven Winners Leaf Joy Greenhouses and plant friends. They mean business when it comes to houseplants. Proven Winners Leaf Joy is not messing around. They are bringing the highest quality houseplants to market in the coolest way. They are selecting only the best plant genetics, growing them in this unreal state-of-the-art, fancy-schmancy European greenhouse. You might have seen me frolicking around the greenhouse in my pink jumpsuit on Instagram. It was heaven. It's this enormous greenhouse filled with every type of houseplant you could dream of. They had a sea of Monstera Thai constellations, a sea of Pink Princess, a sea of rare philodendron, interesting alocasia I had never seen before, including my dream plant, the alocasia cuprea. Pink plants, green plants, variegated plants. If you have a wish list of houseplants, I bet Leafjoy is currently growing or planning on growing all of those plants (laughs) on your wish list. All of the plants on my wish list were there. I still get butterflies when I think about those Thai constellations. And something I really appreciate about the Proven Winners Leaf Joy house plants is that they come with plant tags that have the appropriate plant Latin scientific names of the plants and care guides. So they're setting you up for success. And if you're someone who struggles with picking the right plant for your environment, They've taken the guesswork out of it. They have a color-coded line of collections inspired by different areas of your home. So the Atrian collection is a collection of highlight plants for highlight spaces. The Cocoon collection is a collection of low-light plants for low-light spaces. The Work Life collection is a collection of plants that are on the smaller side. So they're space-saving plants for desks and offices. And then the spa scene collection is a line of plants that thrive in humid environments. You've got to give Leaf Joy plants a try. The next time you're at your favorite garden center, look for the proven winners Leaf Joy plant tags. You will not be disappointed. Find plant joy in Leaf Joy. Dare I say grow joy with Leaf Joy. Head to provenwinners.com to find your local Leaf Joy dealer and let me know which plant you take home on socials. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free plant parent personality test. Because plant friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible. So I made this cutie little plant parent personality quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. 
So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. And not only the seasons in terms of the seasons as we see them here on the planet, because I live in San Diego. Some people say we don't have seasons. I do see the subtlety of the seasons, but I also, you know, ritualize that, make altars for them. But I'm also talking about our internal seasons. For you and I as womb holders, we go through seasons, the four seasons within our own body every 28 days on our cycle. Right now, I am in my fall. I am in my luteal stage. I am in my fall. And understanding the energies of the seasons then helps me understand how I can treat myself when I'm in that season this month, right? So working with the seasons, I- Obsessed. (laughs) And we could talk a little bit more about, you know, the seasons, how it pertains to us womb holders, those of us who bleed on a monthly cycle. We can talk a little bit about how the seasons play into that. Also the elements. I love working with the elements as well. So that would be air, fire, water, and earth. And then, of course, the fifth element, which is ether, which is spirit, which is a lot of what we then bring to the table as the the manipulator, the mover of this energy. And I also love working not just with plants, but with the animals. So one of the things that I love about being a green witch is that every experience I have with nature is a form of communication. Right now, there's some really cool spiders in my garden. This one spider in particular, she's massive. She's beautiful. Every morning when I go check my garden, I actually see her out there re-spinning part of her web. And I appreciate it, but I also recognize there's messages for me in this. There's messages for me in the way I'm weaving and creating my own web in my life right now. And so... When you have this relationship with nature, every bird that flies overhead, every weed that pops up in your yard has guidance for you, has energy for you. And it becomes a much more energizing, guiding, and illuminating experience. And I think that's extremely important, especially right now when we're having this relationship with nature that's very fearful in a lot of ways because of what's happening on our planet. So finding ways to come back to that place of love and trust with earth is really important for where we're going in the future. Oof, I just got such chills. It's that attunement. The attunement starts with learning how to be in touch with the plants and listening silently with them that you talked about earlier. And once you are able to, I think in the book, I say like tune to their frequency, all of a sudden it opens up this world that you have kind of been blind to. And how many times have we not noticed the spider in the garden? But because you've become so attuned to the plants, all of a sudden that awakening or that awe, because that's another thing in my research. It's like plants being in nature is one of the most amazing ways to stimulate awe. And as an adult, like we don't get to access awe in the way that kids do. And that concept of everything, there's a teachable moment in everything. Like there's a lesson in everything. I love that, that you view, you, you ask the spider essentially like, what are you here to teach me? That's so beautiful. I'd love to dive into the moon because Billy jokes that I'm a moon lady. That's his nickname for me, the moon lady. I'm obsessed with her. It's definitely something I've only fallen in love with her since I moved to the country and frankly, like have visibility of her. Uh, When we lived in the city, it was harder to, you know, observe her. But I will say, goodness, I feel like the older you get, the faster time passes. And once you tune to the moon, it really helps you even just process the passing of time. Can you talk a little bit about how the Green Witch uses lunar cycles to live with their lives, with their jobs, with their everything? Like the moon is, I feel like the moon is the answer. She's so amazing. So can you preach a little bit about the moon and her her magnetism? Oh my gosh, I would love to preach about the moon. So let's just, before we even get to kind of the metaphysical, let's think about the moon and the effect and impacts the moon has on Earth, which we know obviously are the tides, right? 
We know that the moon has this magnetic pull. It pulls water from our planet this way and that way. We are, what, 70, almost 80% water in our body. As is the ocean. We have a huge amount of water in our body. If the moon is so powerful that it's literally pulling the oceans, it would make sense that perhaps there's a little pull that's happening within (laughs) us as well while we're going through these moon stages and cycles. Now, it's important to also note that in her entirety, the moon is always full and always whole as she is orbiting around us. It's just our perception of her here on Earth that shifts as sometimes she's shadowed, sometimes she's illuminated by the sun. But that shift of us, the Earth, being in between her and the sun helps us to feel into the shifting tides of our own existence in so many ways. And when it comes to the cycles of the moon, honestly, for so many of our ancestors, that is how we told the passing of time. I think there was something they found in an ancient cave, the first calendar, which was notches either on the wall or on like a bone, notches that went 28 days. Hmm, I wonder what they might have been counting. (laughs) So the way humans have told time and the passing of time has been through the moon because of the way she shifts in the sky with the orbit that's happening. So thinking about the moon, we have every month a new moon and a full moon. A new moon is when the earth is in between the sun and the moon, shadowing it. So we can barely only see a sliver. Sometimes it's almost completely dark. That's the new moon when it starts growing again. The full moon is when the earth is not in the way. So the sun is completely illuminating the moon for us. And there's different energies for both those times. Now, of course, there's different stages to the moon. We have like a waxing moon and a waning moon. For the purpose of this podcast, we'll just keep it really on the energies of the new moon and the growing moon versus the full moon and the shrinking, the the waning moon itself. So a new moon is a time to set our intentions, plant our seeds, get things started again, because this is when the cycle has completed and it's starting anew. So we then have the opportunity to start new projects, launch something, get clear in our intentions, literally plant seeds in our gardens, which I did with my garden this time around. I totally planted it with the moon. And then as the moon continues to build for two weeks, We have more of this energy on our side for growing things, for working on the project, right? Like continue the writing, keeping things moving and growing and in that place of kind of creativity, manifestation, making things happen. Then we have this big culminating energy that is the full moon. And what we want to do with the full moon, what the energies are providing for us is an opportunity to kind of stop be like, okay, what have we done so far? It's, it's the harvest time, but it's also the time to harvest. So if you do have a garden, it's actually a great time to harvest around the full moon. They have this potency. I mean, think about even just the, the levels of water that are going to be in the foods that you're harvesting at that time are going to be at kind of their highest point. So the energy of the food you're going to eat is even like most potent. Now, of course, fresh fruit is always amazing. You don't have to only harvest at the full moon, but if you have the opportunity to, you do have that energetic boost as well. With the full moon, we have this illumination, but then we also have this, like, think about the harvest. What are we doing in a harvest? We're cutting things off. We're taking the fruits away from the plant. We're letting it go right? So with the full moon, we also have this opportunity to be like, here's what worked. Here's what didn't work. That's the illumination. Let's let go of the things that didn't work. And now for the next two weeks until we have the new moon again, we have an opportunity to review, refine, shift, kind of edit that kind of energy. Now, do you want me to talk about eclipses at all? Um, <laughs> get into the energy of eclipses or just keep it at the moon. <laughs> Let's pause there for a minute because I think, especially for an introductory course into plant magic, if you just do that, if you just start looking at the moon, noticing what phase it's in and letting that reflect back for your life, like you are going to see shifts even if they're just internal, not necessarily external, but you are just going to notice this new amazing rhythm in your life that will blow your freaking mind. Two things came up for me when you were talking I wanted to share. Number one, 
this is biased because I'm so excited I'm going to be in it next year, but the Farmer's Almanac, I'm obsessed with the Farmer's Almanac. I love it so much. I read it every year. It's such an old school publication. You can buy it at the grocery store. I have an article that's going to be published in it for the 2024 Almanac, but they have amazing moon resources because a lot of gardeners do biodynamic gardening, which is what you said, you know, you're planting at certain phases of the moon, you're harvesting at certain phases of the moon. And if you're curious about learning more, I can't recommend the Farmer's Almanac enough for just having, you know, 12 months of when the full moon is, when the new moon is, all the eclipses, great explanations, and it costs like nothing at the grocery store. But also just a more emotional thing when you were talking about the moon earlier, I read this in a book somewhere, but, you know, there's something about the moon that also connects us to all of humanity because it's been around for all of humanity. So even though our cities have looked different, our land has looked different over the passing of time, If you really sit and think about the fact that our grandparents, grandparents, grandparents looked up at the moon and wondered about their relationships and wondered about their meals and wondered about their lives in the same way that we do. Like the moon is this incredible gravitational force that people look up at and wonder. And I just think that's so poetic and so magical and a way to connect you to your lineage of your ancestors who have looked at the moon, but also like everyone, all of humanity. I think that's so magical to really sit and think about because there aren't that many reference points that generations over generations over generations can see that aren't the sun, the moon, and the stars. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that is so beautiful. And it actually reminds me of something in my own ancestry. Yes, I 100% agree. There's like this collective energy. And I want to speak a little bit more to that as well. But, you know, I was raised as a religious Jew. I am not religious, but I have a lot of respect for my ancestry. And one thing that's very interesting is there is a lot of focus in Judaism around new moons in particular. They're called Rosh Chodesh, which is the start of the month. And they are known as the female time. Like women gather on new moons and women on Rosh Chodesh were allowed to go. I I was raised as a pretty religious Jew. So it's like, who's allowed to go up and read the Torah? It was usually men. And But on Rosh Chodesh, women can come up and be the ones who read from the Torah. And I mean, don't get me started on like men and women and why it's different. But there was this understanding that the moon has this divine feminine energy. And when you look at it from astrology as well, the moon, our moon sign represents our emotional self, where the sun is more of our forward self, our personality self, the moon is our emotional self. So yes, there's that lineage of knowing that the moon that we look at is the same moon that our ancestors did. But there's also the knowing that the moon affects all of us humans emotionally through its magnetism. And that is a collective experience as well, which is why I love to share about the energies of every new moon and full moon. Because if I'm feeling a certain way, I know I'm not alone. And the feedback I get from people who are subscribed to my moon letters is, yes, it resonates. (laughs) People are often feeling exactly the same. And I think that's actually a really great tool to have. It's one of the reasons I love working with the moon is because it's actually given me so much more acceptance for my emotional self, for my emotional waves, my emotional volatility. Instead of being like, oh, there's something wrong with me. I can be like, oh, I'm feeling extra sensitive because the moon is about to be full. And this full moon is really wanting us to go deep. It's a Pisces full moon coming up next week. Pisces is not comfortable being shallow. Pisces wants to go deep, right? So that understanding gives us so much more compassion and acceptance for our own complexity. Yeah, I am so fascinated by all of this and have just become a student of it because I I just want to learn so much about it. So I've been reading a lot of astrology books and moon books. I'm going to put, I'm going to link them for people who want to dive deeper because I want to hit so many other things in this introductory. We could do a whole episode on the moon, but it's like, wait, it's Greenwich. Let's go back to the plants. Yes, we could. But also that cycle <laughs> thinking, we're not going to dive into it. But if you have a womb and you are interested in connecting to your femininity learning about 
the seasons and your cycle is so mind blowing. It's something that I've been really diving into personally in the last six months. So I'll just, I'll just leave that there for listeners who feel called, but I would love to move on to how are you working with plants specifically? We'll get into the elements and the seasons too, but how are you working with plants as a green witch? Yes. Uh, I mean, there's so many ways. I like to really kind of define it into two different categories. There's kind of what I call active plant magic, active plant medicine versus more passive plant magic, passive plant medicine. So the active plant magic would be things like making your teas, making your tinctures, doing spell bags, using herbs and candles, magical candles, really getting into herbology, even your food, like the kitchen witch that you were talking about earlier, like really blessing your foods, eating fresh foods, what you're putting in your diet. This is all part of the magic that you can harness of plants in a very active kind of ingesting way. For active, can you give an example of why you would make a tincture or why you would make a tea and the motivation and the creation of it? Yeah. Okay. So let's start with tea. And I'm going to go with my favorite because I know it's one of your favorites too. Um, One of my favorite teas to make, fresh teas to make is a borage and mint tea. I have a lot of borage and mint growing in my garden. And the reason I love that tea and why I like to drink it is because of some of the properties of those two herbs in particular. Borage is great for supporting adrenals in particular. And on a metaphysical side, borage has this energy of really calming that part of the brain that is holding ourselves to extremely high expectations that we can never meet. So it's almost like that really self-critical part that's like, you need to be perfect and you're never going to be perfect, right? Like that part of us, Borage is like, that's not necessary. (laughs) So I tend to be someone who can hold myself to really, really high expectations and then negate like my successes sometimes. So when I feel that part of me, I'm like, Borash, come, I need a hug. Can we, can we uh, yeah. have a yeah. conversation? The gravity blanket. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So I love Borash for that. And also just for like the nervous system support and then mint. So first of all, mint just tastes amazing. I love the taste of mint. I've always loved the taste of mint. It's one of my favorite sensory tastes. But then mint also has these characteristics of strength, resilience, communication, and abundance as well. So for me, I love pairing the borage. Borage has this kind of cucumber type flavor to it. And then paired with the mint, it's just so cooling and refreshing. Even when you drink it hot, it has this kind of cooling impact on your body. So if you're running a little hot, which my mercury, my form of communication is in a fire sign, is in Leo. So I can be a little fiery sometimes. <laughs> Me too. I'm very Yep. Yeah. Yep. So to have a tea that I can go to, that's going to help boost my communication, but in a way that kind of cools the fire. It doesn't put the fire out because I want that passion. But sometimes we can get a little impassioned and not always say what we mean from that place as well. So I like using those two for that. I especially love making that tea if I'm going to be doing some, you know, public speaking, when I know I'm really going to be in a place of communicating freely. That's one of my favorite teas to go to. So that's a little bit more of an energizing one for me. If I want a tea for more relaxation, if I'm feeling a little stressed and I really want to calm down, you want to go for herbs that are a little bit more nervines, the ones that are really going to help calm. So some of the ones that might come to your head, lavender, Lavender is well known for its calming impacts. Chamomile is another great tea to use for that as well. I'm growing my own chamomile this year and drying it. And it's been so fun, but it's so funny because you have to grow so much chamomile to get enough to make tea. And it's like my prized possession. It's like I'm slowly accumulating a little mason jar of chamomile, but I'm scared to use it because I'm like, this is so precious. I've worked so hard for this, but I understand that's not the intention with chamomile. I need to grow more next year so I don't feel the scarcity around it. But it's so special. And also chamomile smells so good as a fresh flower. Like apples. It's like apples. It's incredible. I don't think... If you just drink normal chamomile tea that you buy at the grocery store, you don't understand how good chamomile smells. Yeah, it smells so good. But anyway, but so with the teas, what you're saying is the idea is 
you figure out what energy you want to enhance or work with to maybe temper. And then based on your knowledge as a green witch of the different properties of plants, you then make a tea to help either, you know, boost or kind of dull the energies in you. And then my other question is, where do you, obviously your book is one of the answers, but how do you know this? How do you know that lavender is a nervine and borage is good for calming thoughts? And if someone was interested in learning how to do this, or even looking at their garden and saying, oh, I have chamomile and I have calendula, what can I do with that? Because I already have it. Like, how would you begin that journey of figuring that out? Yeah. I mean, the internet is an amazing resource. (laughs) Yeah. But I also, I like you, I love books and I love research. So I have this huge book that I found at Barnes & Noble years ago. That's basically this big book of encyclopedia of natural remedies. And it just has all this information in it about different plants and whether they're you know, what their medical properties are. So whether they're, you know, nervines, which means it comes in the nervous system, whether they are anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, expectorants, demulsants, like whether they help you cough things up, whether they help reduce the inflammation in mucous membranes, things like that. Like it's all listed in that book for me. So that's been an amazing resource for me. Um, and then when it comes to the metaphysical properties, you mentioned some of the books that I love as well. The Green Witch was a great book for me. I love Julia Diaz's books as well. And then also the internet. I Chinese herbology, Chinese uh, traditional Chinese medicine has a lot of really, really interesting information around the energetics of different herbs and plants. My personal practice has involved more learning about and familiarizing myself with some of the more common herbs and flowers, the ones that we would naturally already be growing in our garden for culinary reasons. Like people don't recognize basil there is so much magic and medicine available in basil just as much as there is flavor available in basil as well. Rosemary is one of my favorite herbs to work with for magic as well as for roasting potatoes. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like It's more than just the culinary. And once we know what these properties are, whether it's just the medicinal properties or you're also including the metaphysical properties, like for rosemary, there's this medical property of really being really great for the brain. And then there's this metaphysical property of rosemary being very protective and great at creating boundaries as well. When you have that knowledge, you can then even bring it into your cooking and infuse your meals with the medicine and the magic of the plants as well, which I love doing and what is what a kitchen witch does all the time, right? So, you know, it's really about letting yourself be curious and learning, like being open to learning from lots of different sources. Now, of course, if you're going to be doing internet searches, just use your common sense when it comes to finding good sources. Yeah, vet whoever wrote it. But let me tell you, those secondhand books, those secondhand stores for books. I found amazing herbalism books. Herbalism is a great word to also Google because herbalism and these practices are are very intertwined. I found incredible books from the 80s, from even the 90s, the 70s on herbalism and, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. But The Green Witch is a great, great book to start with. And then tinctures. Why would people use a tincture over a tea? Tinctures are great if you're wanting to kind of give yourself what feels like a dose of medicine over time as opposed to a tea for this specific moment. So for example, I made a tincture from my garden using borage, one tincture with borage and one tincture with rosemary. And the tincture using borage on a daily basis is giving you more of an opportunity to really quiet that self-critical voice over an extended period of time as opposed to like, I need it in this moment, right? So with tinctures, you take drops under your tongue throughout the day. Typically, what you make can last you some months. Rosemary is great also if you're wanting to study and remember things. So I like to take rosemary if I'm in a place of like, learning about all the properties and trying to remember them back. Rosemary is really great for memory in particular. So knowing that, and then rosemary in itself is just good for the brain. There's a lot of research. Again, with a lot of the stuff, they need to do a lot more research because there's just not that much like peer reviewed science over some of it. And a lot of times they stopped at just testing mice and rats. (laughs) So like more, you know, testing with humans. But one thing they're finding is that they really think that rosemary has a great impact on 
brain and like the, you know, how as you age, the brain can kind of deteriorate a little bit, like rosemary helps protect against that. So that's a really good one that you can kind of just make a tincture for and just take over time and especially take when you're in a time of learning and retaining information. I love that. So let's dive in a little bit to the spells of like a spell bag or a spell jar. I think that's what people think about with witches is, oh, they're casting spells all the time. (laughs) But how can you use plants for a spell if you wanted to do that? So spell sometimes is hard for me to use that word because I find that a spell, I think about like a rhyming poem that people say with the practice. And I think that's great. And some people do it. I tend to do the practice without the actual words that go along with it, because to me Mm, that more is like a ritual. Yeah, it's a little bit more of like a ritual because every time I try and I do have I have done some spells and I have one in, in everyday plant magic with Sansevieria. But for me, when I try and make it into like a rhymey thing, it doesn't feel authentic yeah, to me. me too. Whereas when I'm just like in the energy of doing the ritual and thinking about it and being clear on my intention, like that to me is the magic of. So I think for those witches who really like using the spells itself, I would consider those like word witches, <laughs> you know, um, the, using the power of word because there is a lot of magic in our words. There is a lot of power in our words. But one thing that's really important when you're practicing this is the way you're feeling inside is super important. That's where the magic is coming from. So some of my favorite spells or rituals that I like to do with plants, my ultimate favorite is making candles. I love making me some magic candles. And I get these, I do it really simple because candle making can be like intense, but I do it super simple. I get these little beeswax roll-up candles that you just order a pack and they have all these beeswax sheets and little wicks you can cut. And basically you just put a wick in the beeswax and you roll it into a candle. But because you have this great sheet, you have this opportunity to put some herbs into that candle before you roll it up. I also do the intention. I, I get really clear on the emotions that I am either calling in if it's a new moon or the emotions that I am letting go of, of it's a full moon. So am I doing an attraction candle or am I doing more of a banishment candle, right? The attraction would be new moon, the new intentions, new beginnings, the repelling or the banishing would be the letting go for the full moon. So I'll write those words on a little piece of paper, cut those out, put them in my candle too. sprinkle different herbs that actually reflect the energies that I'm either calling in or letting go of roll that up and then burn that. And typically when I burn the candle, I will either sit and journal with it or my favorite thing to do is to put on some music and dance and let the emotions flow through me and just dance as that candle is burning. I love that. So you make your planty intention candle and then you dance your intention. That feels like fun. I love that idea. It's so fun. It's so fun. We'll have to do it on Zoom together sometime. It's so fun. Yes, absolutely. And so is the kind of the same thought, candle, spell bag, spell jar. It's assembling plants that mean something, setting an intention over them, and then either burning them or putting them on your altar or care. Like I would assume a bag is probably something you carry around. Yeah. So like with rosemary, you mentioned rosemary is great about boundaries and protection. So I would assume maybe rosemary would go in a spell bag that you would carry around with you for protection or something like that. Yep, that would would be a great one for it. Or if you're like, here's one of my favorites, a spell bag for abundance, for financial abundance, right? You take a little baggie here. I have one right here I can show you. Oh, tell me more. Tell me more about the spell bag for financial abundance and plants. Just my my little spell bag that's sitting on my altar right now. So you get a little jewelry bag like this, hopefully one that doesn't have like holes in it, like this little velvet jewelry bag. You get clear on the what you're calling in. Now, when it comes to manifestation, it's not just I'm calling in $100,000 or $1 million, or whatever it is. I'm calling in the feeling of financial freedom. I'm calling in the joy and exuberant. Like you're getting clear on the emotions you're going to feel in the having of what you want, Right. So you get really clear on that. You write it on a little piece of paper. You then, once you know what those feelings are, you're like, okay, what plants are going to help me bring that in? 
and you get your little plants. I have a little box, like my magical box of herbs that has like all these little herbs. That... So what plants go for an abundance spell? Ooh, mint, lemon balm. Mint because of it, it's just abundant. Like if you've ever seen the way mint grows, we all, all of us gardeners know, like be cautious with mint because it will eventually like take over. And it, if you put it in a pot, it'll spill out of the pot and somehow ends up in your bed. I don't mind that because I use mint all the time. So it's kind of taken over a whole side of my garden and I am here for okay. it. I am so here for it. <laughs> lemon balm is a really great one, especially paired with mint. Lemon balm is positive, optimistic, lucky, like lemon balms, like I just won the lottery kind of feeling <laughs> without even needing to win the lottery. They just always feel like they won the lottery is lemon balm. So those are two great ones. Now, if you're also calling in with this idea of like financial abundance, this self-love, right? Or confidence in self. One of my favorite plants to work with for self-confidence is actually avocado leaf. And we have two avocado trees in our backyard. So I love using avocado leaf for sense of self-worth and confidence. I mean, think about avocado, right? Like how much are they charging for a single avocado at the grocery store right now? Right. <laughs> yeah. She knows that she's a rich bitch, that avocado. I love it. Yeah. And she has no qualms about it. And she's generous. She's 100% generous, but she's like, I know my worth, peeps. I know my worth, right? So... I love using avocado for that. Rose petals are always great for like just like self-love. So, I mean, there's more. There's obviously more. But my go-tos for financial abundance are going to be first and foremost, lemon balm and mint. And then typically, because for me, it's also about like that confidence of like, I can do this, right? Like often that's avocado that I bring in for that as well. And so if you were to make a ritual candle or a spell bag, for that, would you do that on the new moon? Because that's setting the intention to call this money into your life and having that. And then I'm just thinking, I mean, who doesn't want financial abundance? I'm thinking I have lemon balm and mint in my garden. <laughs> Is that a tea I could make or a tincture I could make that I dr like set the intention over the tincture and then take the tincture every day? Yes. Now, when you're taking the tincture, that's going to be more a sense of like bringing in the positivity into your body, bringing in the mindset. Yes. Yes. Not to mention both of those things also have medicinal qualities to them. So anytime you're going to physically be ingesting a plant, do know that you are taking in whatever medicinal components. Now, and I do want to state because, you know, I am not an herbologist. I'm not a naturopath. Yes, we are not. Please, we are not doctors. Proceed at your own risk, my friends. So yes. And while herbs, for the most part, are very safe, you know, if you are on someone who's on medication or who is currently pregnant or breastfeeding or looking to become pregnant, you do want to work with someone who knows their stuff because there can be counterindications and Herbs definitely have an impact on reproduction as well, both positively and negatively, which is actually a really good thing for us to know in the current climate we're in. So totally. <laughs> yeah. But just keep that in mind. What about plant placements? I know that. So that was some of the active plant magic we were talking about. I know you also talk about yes. passive plant magic and orienting your home with certain plants that call in certain energies. So can you kind yes. of give us an intro to that in case we want to dive deeper there? Yes, for sure. And then just... Very quickly, for those people who are looking to learn more about the rituals we just talked about, spell bars, spell jars, bags, and the plant candles and things like that, you can find that all on my book, Everyday Plant Magic. Everyday Plant Magic. We'll link it in the bio. It's so good. If you guys are, if this episode is setting you on fire, you must get this book, Rick Howell's book. It's so good. And it's so accessible to a beginner. Like you really outline things really beautifully for someone who is just interested in learning more, you know? So anyway, shout out to your book, but passive plant magic. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Passive plant magic. So I think though, what people will most identify with passive plant magic is like feng shui. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And like people are kind of familiar with that. The idea of the way we place things in our homes impacts the flow of energy into our home. There are a lot of you know, lessons or, or teachings that have come through in feng shui about plants in particular, some of which I resonate with, some of which I don't. But it speaks to the fact that each of these plants in themselves have their own energy, move their own energy. And when we have that knowing, we can get really intentional with how we place them. So for example, in feng shui, one of the things I share in everyday plant magic is what's called a bagua map. 
which is basically like a little map of your home. I'm going to turn to it in the book just so I can show it. So do you see this little box right here? So this is the Bagua map. And it basically is saying that these are the different like corners of your home, the orientation of your home. So each part of your home. So if you enter in the front door, the back left corner of your home is the abundance and prosperity corner. Whereas the right corner, back right corner is all about love and relationships. So if this is like the map of where these themes, these energetic themes exist in your home, you can then note, oh, I want to put some plants in or some crystals in that are going to support abundance and prosperity. I want to put that in the back left corner of my home as long as like the light supports the plants growth and everything, right? Obviously with plants, we want to make sure they have the right amount of light. But this gives you an idea of where you can place things to call in or move out certain energies around themes. So that's one way to do it using feng shui. My favorite way to work with placement of plants has to do with the energetics of the plants themselves, whether they have more of what is called that that yin, kind of like feminine, flowy, creative, relaxing, emotive kind of energy. And when I say masculine and feminine, by no means am I implying gender. I'm talking about energetics, okay? Yin and yang. Exactly. Whereas the yang is more of that masculine, active, like, I'm going to just take action. I'm going to make structure and I'm going to go for it, like energizing. So the yin is a little bit more restorative, whereas the yang is a little bit more energizing. And when we know that, we can then use our plants in really intentional ways. So for example, right above my computer, I have a dracaena, a dragon tree a Sansevieria, a snake plant, a Syngonium, and some jade. So what I'm doing is I'm actually balancing the yin and the yang here in my workspace so that I have a balance of my active, I'm going to do the thing energy with my more receptive, restorative. I'm going to do it from a place of receiving information, not always just like pushing forward as well. So for example, in your bedroom, If you're having a hard time falling asleep, staying asleep, you don't want to put active young plants in your bedroom. If you're having trouble with sleep and staying asleep, don't put your Sansevieria, don't put your Dracaena. Your plants that have very upright structure and kind of pointed leaves and things that go straight up like a cactus would, those would be considered more of the yang type energies in the plant. Whereas plants that have like the pathos where they kind of like spill out and they have kind of heart-shaped rounded leaves and they can either, like if you can train them to grow up, but otherwise they'll just kind of spill downward. That's a little bit more of the yin energy. And of course, there's plants that have a good balance of both. So for example, alocasia, there's one behind me. Alocasia is a great example of a plant that's really good with both. Fiddle leaf fig is another example of, to me, that's a plant that really balances those two. But just knowing that can help us create more restorative and more energizing place spaces within our home. And this is so interesting because I get this comment all the time. When you think about Sansevieria, and I have one right here, so I'll bring it down so you can see it. This is my little office Sansevieria. Love him. (laughs) I love this guy. So often when we think about Sansevieria, I mean, look at it. It looks like a sword, right? And, And in fact, I think in Brazil, they're called like St. George's Sword or something. Like one of their common names speaks to that. People very naturally tend to place these at the entryways to their home. Have you noticed that? Which I think is actually our intuition. I think we are so much more intuitive than we give ourselves credit for. And I think that plants are communicating with us in ways that we don't even comprehend. But people very naturally place these at the entryways to their home, by their front doors, by their back doors, which is a perfect place for this plant to be because its energy wants to protect the energy of your home. It wants to keep out bad energy and it wants to keep in good energy. So... You're basically like, this is the knight in shining armor at my doorway. It's my bouncer. And that's exactly the energy yeah. it has to have. Oh, I, my energetic bouncer, the sense of area. <laughs> oh <laughs> I, love God, I love that. I love that. That's beautiful. <laughs> Before we wrap up, I'd love to ask just, can you give a quick high level working with the seasons and elements? Yes. Okay. So when we work with the seasons, it's about allowing ourselves to flow with natural cycles, recognizing we're not always meant to grow and bloom. We're supposed to have moments of 
rest of yes, um, yes. <laughs> what's the term when plants go into their rest? Oh my god, I'm totally dormancy. Blanking. Yeah, dormancy. That's the word I was looking for. So starting with summer, because we're kind of ending summer right now. Summer is represented by the element of fire. Fire is action. Fire is <gasps> eating up the oxygen, doing things, growth. It's definitely this like high intensity feeling, right? So fire, summer, we have this energy. We want to use the energy. We want to do things. We want to play with people. We want to be on the beat. Like we also need to cool off a little bit with all that fire. Technically fire this year as well too. Then we move into fall. Fall is wind. And that actually really plays out. I mean, think about the windy, balmy fall days as well. Wind is this element that also represents our mind. Fire represents kind of our heart and our will. Wind is more of our mind and our thoughts. So fall is a time when we're starting to slow down, but we still do have this energy and we're kind of flowing with it a little bit, but we're starting to get a little bit more reflective. And then we get into the water season of winter. Winter is a time when we're allowed to hibernate. We're supposed to hibernate a little bit. Swim in your own depth. Yeah. Yeah. And water, I mean, water is so incredible. I'm a little bit biased, but like water is our emotions, but water is also our truth. Every time I talk about water, I have to state that every single drop of water that exists on this planet is every drop of water that has ever existed on this planet, just continuously cycling in our planet, Mm. which means water has this amazing relationship with history and truth. I love that. Which for us lets us understand that our emotions are actually gateways and doorways into our truth as well. And winter is a great time to give us a dormant period, a quieter period where we don't have to focus as much on growth. I have to state, that being said, my last two books were like either due in winter or launched in winter. (laughs) So, you know, we got to flow with life too. Your internal winter doesn't necessarily need to match up with the the Earth's external winter. Yeah. But even like knowing that I was doing a launch and fall into winter, I was like, okay, I have to give myself more of these like dormant moments in sandwiching this kind of exertion of energy I have to give as well, being that it's not really in my cycle naturally to do so right now. And then we move into spring. Spring is earth. Earth is what helps things grow in so many ways. Earth is the the soil, the womb from which everything grows. So as we head into spring, we're starting to want to start afresh, start anew. That's why we often do spring cleanings, right? Like that's like sometimes, and that's why when you look at astrology, the new year starts with Aries. It starts in that spring cycle, in that sense of like the new beginning. So yeah, did that answer your question? That was gorgeous. And if you take anything from this episode, Plant Friends, acknowledging that you have four seasons alongside nature seasons That has probably been one of the most powerful shifts in all of this research and all of the books on astrology and magic that I've read, like living in sync with the moon, but also just acknowledging your own seasons. We are conditioned to constantly be in summer as a society, as ourselves. Push, 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 push. I almost institutionalized myself from burnout because I pushed so hard for two years and I did not let myself take a break. And now winter has become so sacred to me because I don't think I ever let myself experience that dormancy until I moved to the country. And I also went through that burnout experience where I was like, whoa, this isn't going to work anymore. But just giving yourself a little bit of space to understand what your seasons could look like and how well you're doing and and maybe assess how you might be able to invite seasons back into your life. Man, that is magic. I mean, because that is energy, right? So Raquel, this has been so fun. Where can everyone find you and what can everyone get so excited? Now, this episode is going to air October 30th. So what can everyone get excited about? Are we allowed to talk about your book? Yeah. Yeah, we can. Okay. So where can everyone find you and pre-order your upcoming book? (laughs) Okay. So you can find me at Infinite Succulent for the time being. I'm going to be going through a rebranding, but we'll keep you posted. It'll be after October for sure. But you can find me at Infinite Succulent at all the places. I'm most active on Instagram and on TikTok. 
And then my website is infinitesucculent.com. And you can find all kinds of great stuff in there, including signed copies of my books, some older classes I've done, and I work one-on-one with people as well. So if people are looking to kind of reconnect and realign themselves with nature in really magical ways. That is totally what I do with my clients. Now, I have a third book, which will be coming out probably in April of 2024 called Self-Care for Eco-Anxiety. And it's 52 nature-based self-care practices to deal with the intense feelings of fear, depression, grief, anger, and disempowerment that our current society has going on with the issues around climate change and environmental destruction. So, and this is a book that is very near and dear to my heart because as I've mentioned, I have had my own journey with eco-anxiety. Yeah. It's this perfect like full circle moment for you and accessing all the different elements of who you are. I'm so excited for you. Yeah. It's not as woo as everyday plant magic. (laughs) You know, like we don't talk about the chakra system. You have a little something for everyone in your your books. But, and I'm also very excited because I'm going to start studying with you. I guess by the time this episode airs, I'll be in a coaching program with you for using plants to connect to your intuition. I'm so excited to learn more from you on my spiritual journey. And I think everybody else should too. So we're going to link to all of those things in the show notes. And it's a pleasure as always. And I can't wait to have you back for another conversation for when your book launches next year. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. I adore conversations with you, Maria. And I think that we are kindred souls. So thank you so much. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. A very magical thank you to my dear friend, Raquel. Check out her book, Everyday Plant Magic. If this episode inspired you, her email list is also great because she does the moon emails. She's magically magical. (laughs) My little witchy friend. She's the best. I love her. She's really helped me kind of open my awareness personally to the magic of nature and kind of taking the next step in my relationship with nature. Now that I've got the caring for it, now that I've got the self-care down, like how can I root even deeper to my passion for nature through expanding my awareness about the magic around it? And I'm actually studying with her right now. She has an intuition program where you use nature to tap into your intuition that I'm in and I will report back and let you know what I learned. You can go follow her. Her links are in the show notes. And my plan friends, I wish you an incredibly spooky and incredibly magical season. I hope you're carving pumpkins that you grew yourself. I hope you're picking all the apples. I hope you have a great Halloween costume. Most importantly, I hope you spend some meaningful, magical time with your plants today in whichever capacity you feel most called to. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to green up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. 
Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test. Because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible. So I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. (music) 